Oh, another one. I suppose you want to hear about that story too, huh? So vile it makes my spine chill just thinking about it. Well, I've got nothing better to do. So I suppose, one last time, I could retell the tale of the Hex. I received a note from a pretty little lady, and I knew she wouldn't take no for an answer. So, I got on the case. How little I knew back then. Our story begins on a dark and stormy night, with the sole refuge for miles being the old and rustic Six Pint Inn. A phone rang, the barkeep picked it up, and through the other side, I heard that someone was planning a murder. <laughs> but who is to be doing the murdering, and why? Well, sweetie, like I said, this ain't no open shut case. I was gonna have to get my hands dirty for this one. Suspect number one, Weasel Kid. He acted oddly around Space Boy over there, but people tend to tense up in situations like this. We get used to it on this kind of job. The barkeep sent him upstairs to get a key, but as he did, the floorboards cracked from underneath him, and he fell to his death. The murdering so soon? No, he was only knocked out, which led to a flashback. Super Weasel Kid, the good old days. We find ourselves in a sunny field and are greeted by a kind Mr. Shrewd who sends us on our way to adventure. Needless to say, the game has overwhelmingly positive reviews. As Mr. Machine puts it, who needs a game over screen anyway? I see a promising career for him in game journalism. We continue running into a prophet who seems to break character, refusing to tell us some nonsense as a reward for finding her. So here's a real secret. This game was built on the ashes of another. She refuses to tell us more, so we continue on, until running into what can be best described as a robed runt, who tells us something equally disconcerting. Look at you, you poor fool. Oh, to be replaced by such mediocrity. We chase after him, only to fall into another flashback. Super Weasel Kid 2, Radical Road, the long-awaited sequel. Things have changed, we got shades, the clouds are wrapping, and Mr. Shrew has gotten older. We continue to get nothing but good review- uh, uh, I mean it's nothing. Am I gonna let one loser ruin my day? Oh, another one. This isn't okay. The prophet tells us some bullshit about Reginald's revenge, whoever that is, but we just keep running from the haters. The robed runt is waiting for us again, mocking the game's fall in quality. We do our best to ignore him and get to the final installment. Super Weasel Kid 09, Super Redux, The Fall. The sky is a dull blue, the music downtrodden, and instead of good old Mr. Shrew greeting us, we get him. We ignore the bum, continue on, and find ourselves in a terrible game filled with bugs, glitches, and negative reviews weighing us down. We fall, and end up as low as one can be. But what could have caused this drop in quality? Without nearly enough evidence to find the culprit, I continued with my observations. The old chap called Bryce over this time, calls himself an ex-fighter, but I know more than anyone. Your past has a way of sticking with you, no matter how fast you can punch. Before the first fight. This flashback follows Bryce, a former Cooking Quest character, as he's trained to fight by this blue man, Irving, but we'll learn more about him later. He begrudgingly agrees to do his fights until we reach Chanduel, the same sorceress as the one back in the inn, although this flashback occurs before they first met. She also seems, um, not very interested in fighting, but still tries to win, because she knows that if she wins enough, she'll be considered broken by the game developers, and banned from the game, sparing her from a life of constant battle. 
Her plan walks, and she's banned in the middle of our fight. This idea inspires Bryce, and so we do the same, winning over and over, working our way to the top through a badass training montage, until only one character stands in our way, Doubt Clown Sato. She does not consider herself to be a fighter, no no no. She's really more of a performer. Okay, that was anticlimactic. Holy shit! She returns, enveloping the entire stage, and uses everything from our health bar to giant hands to a rubber ducky, all to attack us. Yet, we still prevail. She applauds us, and at this point, Rice is finally considered strong enough to be broken, and banned from the game. Granny, I'm coming home. Cooking Granny, a new beginning? Bryce is back in his home with a smile, and Granny is happy to have him. They immediately start baking like he never left. Granny gets faster and faster, things start to get hectic, but a voice interrupts them. The blue man is back. He tells Bryce that they need him for Combat Arena X 2, which Game Funa is developing, who now also owns the rights to Cooking Mama. Refusing to go, Bryce rips off his shirt and prepares to fight this time for his freedom. Irving compliments his stance, and uh, uh, Grandma! He's forever kicked out of gaming for hitting an innocent NPC, and after wandering the streets, he finds a job offering at the Six Pint Inn, looking for a willing cook. With no other options, that's where he heads. Ah. Uh. The classic ex-boxer now cook is tricked into knocking out his own grandma by a blue man with satanic undertones. I've seen it hundreds of times, but this was not the murder I was hired to investigate. Now, it was that dam's turn for action. She fiddled with some tech, laid down, and in an unforeseeable plot twist, fell into a flashback. Secrets of Legendaria, on release day. This flashback follows Chandrel the Sorceress, who was reassigned here after being banned from Combat Arena X. She's joined by Lazarus the Knight on a quest through an RPG, all while being streamed by a famous Twitch star. Chandrel has not changed in the slightest, and has no interest in being the hero of Legendaria. So, she makes a deal with Valamir, the Dark Lord, the very one that she, the hero, is supposed to be defeating. If she brings him all three orbs of power, he agrees to destroy the world of Legendaria, freeing her from the role as its hero. Lazarus goes along with it, although he doesn't exactly understand what it all means. Irving is back, and after learning of their plot, intercepts, using the fog to block the player's view, making an attempt to replace them with someone more compliant. But they manage to hold him off until the fog disperses, at which point he makes himself scarce, and we see that the robed runt was the one who steered us out of the mist, who tells Chandrel to visit the Six Pint Inn if she's ever in trouble again, then disappears. We hand all three orbs of power over to Valamir, who immediately turns the world to hell. Twitch chat goes nuts, and the game is flooded with poor reviews, ending the game forever. Irving comes out of his office with some terrific news. As punishment for causing this disaster, he sends Lazarus to Vicious Galaxy, where he'll fight aliens for the rest of his days. And for Chandrel, he has something special in mind. He decides to let Valamir inhabit a space inside of her head, leaving her stuck with him forever. So it turned out this machine she had been working on was a device to pull a purple guy out from inside of her head. At this point, I was far more confused than I was at the start of my investigation, so I decided it would be wise to continue on. Next up is this rust guy. I've seen his type before. Crazy folk who murmur to themselves, think they're tough shit. Enjoy League of Legends too. Terrible people, really. Scum on Earth. After being led upstairs by some holograms, he reached a room with that same robed runt that's been popping up everywhere. 
Lightning flashed and initiated a flashback. Waste World, Unfinished Business. This flashback tells the story of Rust and his debatably radioactive son, Rocky, as they venture through the wasteland. Although problems quickly begin popping up, missing textures, glitches, and aliens? Essentially, this game was never finished, so Modders took it over, throwing in all sorts of out-of-place enemies, cheats, and mods, confusing the hell out of Rust and Rocky, who are both in way over their heads. Eventually, they run into everybody's favorite performer, Sado. She continues with her love for chaos and messes with poor old Rust, killing Rocky while leaving Rust helpless to do anything to save his son. We use a mod to turn back time, but she just kills him again, and again, and again. She sends Rust into hard mode, and at this point, Rust has already lost it, talking to himself like Rocky is still with him, Things get worse and worse, until Sato tricks Rust into thinking Rocky is still alive, reigniting his hope only to blow it out once again. At this point, he has gone completely mad. Sato shoots him and he's left drifting in open space. Then we see as he slowly, solemnly makes his way to the Six Pint Inn. <sighs> Maybe he wasn't that bad of a guy like I thought he was. A real victim of circumstance. Lucky for me, the runt decided to take off his robe, revealing his true identity. I have never seen this man in my life. Suddenly, a knock at the front door, splitting my attention. I chose to check out what was going on downstairs. It's not like there's too much risk of anything happening up here. One of these guys is far too crazy for a planned murder, and the other looks like he's more at risk from that fungus growing through his skull than actually killing anyone. The barkeep sent Lazarus into the kitchen, and despite following him, I could hear that Irving scumbag walk in. What could he want this time? With some tips from the barkeep, Lazarus managed to find a secret room, full of weapons like I had never seen. He steeled his resolve, walked out, and confronted Irving. The blue man called his bluff, but he raised his gun, lined up his aim. This was what I had been waiting for? Hold that thought. We have a flashback to go through. Vicious Galaxy 2, or something like it. After being caught for his involvement in destroying the secrets of Legendaria, Lazarus has been put into Vicious Galaxy, every NPC's worst nightmare and is now preparing for a mission. He's accompanied by Jay and Junior, who also resided in Legendaria before it was destroyed, and also the robed runt, whose name turns out to be Jeremiah. Their quest? Retrieve the artifact. We mow down aliens left and right, showing no mercy. This mission cannot fail. But as we get ready to invade the premises, Jay has second thoughts. Nervous for the mission ahead, so Junior shoots him. We run into an alien who condemns us for the invasion, even calling Jeremiah by name, and is quickly revealed to be Irving himself. This entire mission was a trick. While we might have thought we were attacking an alien base, we were really helping an attack on Gameworks itself. Jay didn't quit because he was scared of the mission, but rather the punishments he would receive for carrying it out. Before Irving can condemn us anymore, Weasel Kid, the inside man, sets off an explosion, taking out the floor beneath our feet. We regain consciousness, having fallen all the way to the bottom floor, and see poor Junior, who died as his father lived, not contributing a single thing to the game. We connect some wires, get the elevator running, and pick up a pair of Uzis, brutally mowing down anyone who crosses our path while it's serenaded with some ever-tasteful elevator jazz. We meet back up with Jeremiah and make our way to the detention center. The artifact is surrounded by guards, so we're going to have to free an NPC to cause some chaos, a particularly dangerous one. We run past some former bosses and come face to face with Sado. 
Over the bickering of all the prisoners, we begrudgingly remove the restraints, and everyone goes silent. Sado disappears. We wake up in a storage facility, find the artifact, but Sado beats us to it. As a reward for freeing us, she decides to put on a little show instead of just instantly killing us. She makes us fight a crab monster, take part in a battle royale, and even battle against herself. We somehow manage to defeat her, and she disappears. The artifact returns to us, and we make our escape. But as we leave, we see a small spider crawl out from the boxes. Sado has not truly been defeated, not even close. While escaping, we see Irving talking to what looks like a real person through a triangle on the wall. But now's no time to meander, so we continue on with our escape. And just like that, I had done it. I solved the case. Lazarus was the killer. Whoa, uh, hold on a second. Wheel suddenly stopped time and decided to tell me more of what I already knew. But I'm not satisfied with this kind of ending, nor are my clients. So I decided I should keep on playing with this bartender's game for now, to see where it all would lead. Called over the most stylish man in the bar, and sent him to his personal cabin, where they entered a secret room and fell into the final flashback. Walk. Magnum Opus. We set out in first person view, and hear Lionel Snill, the creator of all the games we've been playing, as he explains that this is the developer commentary for his true Magnum Opus, Walk, which will bring us through his awe-inspiring story that brought him to become the phenomenal game developer he is today. His beginnings were quite modest, starting at 12 in his own room, making Weasel Kid based on his very own pet weasel. During development, he used the help of Gameworks Assistant, which gave him ideas for secondary characters, along with helping in game design, although Lionel quickly grew to depend on it. After some more Weasel Kid games, he ended up signing a lucrative contract with Gamefuna, agreeing to sell the rights of his future games to them. But let's look at this CEO a bit more closely. It seems he was dealing with the devil. Also note that this document sealing the contract is done through Gameworks, which is merely meant to be a tool to help make games. So are they trying to help Lionel or Gamefuna? With his newfound cash, he hired an entire team to work on his new IP, Combat Arena X. The most important person of that team being Carla. She was a childhood friend of Lionel, and although they never got along great, she was about the only friend he ever had. Walk on Combat Arena X was going well, but after a dispute about the number of female characters in the game, she created Sado, a character solely designed to mess with Lionel's games. Lionel grew tired of the constant demands for patches to his game, and moved on to his next project, Secrets of Legendaria. He pushed his team to the limits for this one, it was going to be revolutionary. To give it that extra push that would lead it to stardom, he hired some of the biggest Twitch streamers out there to play it on release day. But as we saw, things don't go so well. In his anger, he blames it on Carla for purposely leaving bugs in the game, despite her having nothing to do with it this time. He took what little money was left from the company and fled further south. Walking alone once again, he began development for Wasteworld, but would rarely make it more than an hour into coding before getting distracted by negative articles. He never ended up finishing Wasteworld, and in a bold artistic choice, left this section of the walk unfinished as well. His parents would call to check in with him, but he would just lie. He never had been good with people, and now that he had pushed his only friend aside, he was alone. His final straw was when Martyrs started messing with his game. If he wasn't going to finish it, nobody was, especially those despicable Martyrs. Oh, did he ever get fired up when he got his hands on those legal documents. 
his greatest joy became taking others down. Those disgusting scrubs. Though- Jeremiah interrupts our game for the final time, and tells us to walk back once we came, when we see a door of light. He skips us past Lionel's ranting, and we reach the end of the game. This scene represents not Lionel's past, but his future. All the recent indie games have been pretty shit, so walk is a shoe in for game of the year. We grab the trophy, and before sending us off, Lionel hopes his story is as inspirational to us as much as it was to him. His modesty truly knows no bounds. If we heed Jeremiah's words and retrace our steps upon seeing a door of light, we learn of a terrible truth. An opening through the runway reveals itself, and upon following a light-guided trail, we'll find a computer, and for one last time, we play a game, in a game, in a game. Some quaint 8-bit music chimes in, and we begin dishing out drinks in root beer tender, while playing as the bartender from Six Pint, although a much younger and able-legged one. And in the corner, an unhooded Jeremiah sweeps the floor. Customers flood in, and our score continues to grow the more and more we serve. It's nice to finally be able to play a peaceful game. No violence, carnage, or outsiders trying to shut things down. All we have to do is keep on serving root beer to happy customers. We might miss one or two, but we mustn't cry over spilled milk. Or in our case, root beer. <laughs> he loves me. After being served, customers are quick to... Won't leave. Lionel wants this. A revenge plot, huh? I won't say I didn't see this one coming, because I definitely did. Regardless, we're back to the present. The old man gets everyone to put their hands on that artifact thing Lazarus picked up. And, well, I've never been one to say no to a pretty face. So, I did as he said. He uttered some words in a mythical language, and tells us that we are all... Uh, wait, what? No, 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 this can't be right. Oh, what's going on? What ritual is he talking about? Who is that? I don't know where that guy's going, but uh, anyway, that's not nearly everything. We still have many unanswered questions, but first, the secret ending. Or something like it. If we find our way to Wizaro, an NPC inside a Gameworks headquarters, we can enter a secret cipher which unlocks some messages sent between Carla and Lionel. At this point, Lionel has left the company, and Carla clearly isn't too pleased with him. But, as she's his only friend, agrees to take some secret files of his in the case that something happens to him. Well, something happens, and as per her agreement, Kala hides the files inside of a game of her own, Beneath the Surface, a quaint fishing game which now hides a dark secret within its code. If we fish from the perfect depth, we can pull up an old locket with the Gameworks logo on it, and after entering a secret cipher, we gain access to Lionel's files. We find ourselves in an early access version of the walk, and listen, as Lionel, no longer in a cocky tone, but a sad and desperate one, talks about his suspicions. I'm recording this because I've... This is crazy, right? While it sounds crazy, he's been getting a weird feeling that his characters have come to life. It's probably just some trolls, but if by some chance it is true, he thinks he would owe one of his characters an apology. He explains how Root Beer Reggie was based off his grandpa, Reggie Wilkinson. This way, even after his grandpa moved on, he still had Reggie. After the success of Super Weasel Kid, he hid all evidence of Root Beer Tender to make it look like Super Weasel Kid was his first game, like he was some sort of prodigy. 
he couldn't bear to do it himself, so he got Irving to do it for him, and never saw him again. But, well, if you're, you're out there, there somewhere, somewhere Reggie, Reggie, I still miss you. And I'm sorry. Too bad Reggie never got to hear those words. The game crashes, and while trying to reboot, it seems Seda was not so keen on us learning anymore. So, here are the questions we still have to answer. Who is Lionel's grandfather? How do Lionel's characters come to life? What is the artifact? What are Irving's goals? What are Gamefuna's goals? And what are Sado's goals? We'll be going over these three first, as they are heavily intertwined with each other. From the little information we receive in the Hex, Inscription, and Pony Island, you may be surprised to hear that Lionel's grandfather, Reggie Wilkinson, is one of the most important characters in all of Daniel Mullen's games. So, let's start at the beginning of Reggie's story. A powerful but evil relic referred to as the Old Data is found in the hands of the Soviets, and in an attempt to get it into safer hands, Reggie Wilkinson and a man named Mr. Kaminsky steal it off Hitler's rotting corpse and send it to Gamefuna, all the way in America. Then, in the events of Inscription, we discover that this old data has the power to bring characters to life, among many other things, such as corrupting all those who stay in contact with it for too long. So, that's why Reggie is such an important character, but how did this end up affecting his grandson? To put it in layman terms, I do not know. Nor does anyone else though, it's not just me. I mean, why would he involve his, at the time, 12 year old son with an ancient and incredibly evil relic he picked off Hitler's rotting corpse? After spending many hours thinking of different ways this situation could make a lick of sense, I have finally come up with a theory. After stealing the old data from the Soviets, Reggie was in hot water over in Europe and he needed somewhere to hide. Perhaps only for a day, he took refuge in his child's house. His child who, at this point, was also a parent, with their son, Lionel. In the small amount of time he was there, a fragment of the old data got onto Lionel's computer. Perhaps some of it was left behind after Reggie made an attempt to decode it, or perhaps the old data is conscient enough that it made an active attempt to leave a piece of it behind so it could escape Reggie. Either way, a small piece of the old data was now on 12-year-old Lionel Snill's computer, which manifested itself as the artifact, aka the Hex. So that clears out those three questions, now for Irving. What are his and Bi-Relation Gameworks goal in all this? First, it'd be best to explain Gameworks and Gamefuna's connection. We know surprisingly little about both groups. I mean, the only character we ever see working at Gameworks is Irving, a literal NPC. We know a bit more about Gamefuna, although only by a little. We know that their founder is Satan himself, and that they are trying to obtain the old data for unknown purposes. It's my theory that Gameworks is simply a puppet made by Satan to keep watch over and maybe even study the fragment of the old data. This is no unfounded guess either. We know Irving has been communicating heavily with the devil, and from the tarot cards we find in Inscription, we know that Irving visited the game during its creation, the game made by Gamefuna. Lastly, we can even find Asmodus, one of Satan's daemons, inside of Secrets of Legendaria, a game which Gameworks supplied many of the extra NPCs for. Satan must have given him over to Irving for safekeeping. So, either Satan discovered how close young Lionel was with his grandfather, the one who managed to get his hands on the old data, or perhaps he's just able to detect it and knew when a piece ended up on Lionel's computer. Whichever the case, he then created Gameworks, along with Irving, to trick young naive Lionel Snill into installing Gameworks' assistant onto his computer, which brought with it Irving and all the other NPCs he needed to complete his task. After Lionel had made a few more games, Irving set up a contract between Lionel and Gamefuna, which had them buying all the rights to Lionel's past and future games. Not only did this let them study the effects of the old data with even more ease, 
The payment Lionel received guaranteed him to continue making more games. With his newfound money, Lionel was able to hire many more people, including but not limited to Carla. But it didn't take long for them to get at odds with each other, and this is where Sado comes into play. With her anger directed at Lionel for acting oh so superior to her and everybody else on the team, she created a character whose sole purpose was to mess with Lionel's games. And boy, did she deliver. But Sado was no ordinary NPC. During the walk, we see a summoning circle drawn next to Carla's desk, indicating the influence of the devil. I mean, it's really not like her to create something so evil, as she is generally attributed to cute things like a rubber duck. So, I believe Satan took advantage of her anger to manipulate her into creating a monster, far more powerful than she could ever have intended. Something she couldn't control. On top of that, she shows further guilt once realizing just how badly Sado messed with Lionel's games, and by extension, life which is the only reason she agrees to hide Lionel's files inside of her game. However, we know what happened to those. This shows that Sado couldn't care less about the wants and wills of her creator, and only follows the original ideologies she was made with. Create Havoc. Bonus points if that Havoc is directed towards Lionel. She won't even cooperate with Satan's second-in-command as we see that Gameworks has to imprison her to keep her from wreaking even more chaos. In the next video, we'll see that she makes her way all the way to Game Funa and potentially even walks with them, but that's a bit outside this video's range. At this point in our story, The Secrets of Legendaria has come out and self-destructed on release, leading to Lionel's abandonment of his very own company, who then started and never finished Wasteworld. While Lionel was dealing with some lawsuits against the martyrs, the attack on Gameworks headquarters was made, which led to Jeremiah obtaining the artifact, and the escape of the recently apprehended Sado. It's important to remember, this entire game, Reggie and Jeremiah have slowly but surely been following through with a plan of their own. A plan of vengeance against their creator for abandoning them, just as foretold by the soothsayer. They've been collecting all of the protagonists from Lionel's games, all like them, all wanting revenge on Lionel for creating them. Reggie may have once been a kind soul, but after years of festering around the old data, combined with the sorrow of his creator leaving him for dead, he's become unrecognizable from the man he once was. Now, all he cares for is his retribution. It hasn't just affected him though, we can see it in all the other characters too, in their demeaning to downright evil attitudes, despite being protagonists. But Reggie and Jeremiah, they've been here since the very start, have marinated in the old data's presence for even longer. They are once joyous souls utterly destroyed by the old data's evil. And then we have poor old Rust. Too pure to be corrupted by the old data, and too kind to go along with Reggie's plot for revenge. So, Reggie used a serum on him to shatter his mind, an injury not at all helped by Sado's purgatory of a trip she brings him on. He only goes along with the plan out of confusion, in his delusional state, somehow hoping that this will reunite him with Rocky, his dead son. The essence of the old data that has slowly seeped into all of them throughout the years has tainted them with evil, but lets them, with the help of the artifact, open a portal for a brief moment, just long enough for Reggie to exact his revenge. Reggie never gets to hear Lionel's apology, and ends up killing his grandson with nothing but hatred on his mind. Using this opportunity, Sado manages to sneak her way out into the real world. And that is the story of the Hex. My next video will finally be the one connecting all of Daniel Mullen's games together in one hopefully cohesive video. But for now, thank you for watching. It really does mean so much to me.